is talking to you today. My name is Nora Spitoff, and at the age of seven, I published my first book. It's called Flying Fingers, Master the Tools of Learning Through the Joy of Writing. And more recently, I published a second book. It's called Dancing Fingers, and it's a book of poetry that I co-authored with my older sister. Now, uh, one of my favorite things to do, actually, is read. And when you read, um, often in class, you might be asked to write something called a response to literature. Now, to bring this into perspective a little bit, have you ever gotten into an argument with a brother or sister or friend about what to watch on TV or what TV show is the coolest? Raise your hand if you ever have. <laughs> I see some raised hands. Probably nearly everybody has gone through that kind of thing. If not TV, it might be the, what's the best book, whatever. Uh, have you ever tried to convince someone that a certain book or band was the coolest? <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of raised hands. Probably so. So how did you convince them? What did you tell them to try to convince them that it was? Think that you do. So when you write a response in literature, you have the opportunity to think about a book we like, 
where you read passages, share ideas, and learn more from the characters. It lets you kind of go deeper. We have the chance to make our enjoyment of the book last longer. When we write our response to literature, we have the opportunity to convince other people that we are right. When we write a response to literature, we have the opportunity to defend a story we like, you learn a sophisticated conversation skill, and writing a response to literature helps you successfully respond to other people throughout your life. And then, another cool thing is that when you write a response to a book, story, poem, or movie, you have a chance to express your thoughts, feelings, opinions, and ideas about it, and it lets you explore those on a deeper level. Now, I like this analogy. It's kind of like when you get in an argument with your sister about what show to watch on TV. So, me argue with my sister about how dumb America's Next Top Model is. So you might try to convince her that the show is really boring, maybe the plot, the characters, let's say it's an um, a, a episodic show or something, um, or the way the story is told, you might say the storyline is unrealistic, a character is too perfect, something like that. So when you write a response to a book that you don't like very much, you use the same tactics. You would try to convince your reader that the book isn't worth their time. So you can write a response to literature to books that you really like or really don't like. Uh, you should probably feel kind of strongly about it just so that you have uh, that emotion to back up. Now, if you were trying to convince your brother or sister that his or her show wasn't worth watching, what kind of example might you give in order to support an argument? So just hypothetically. Mm -hmm. you? That, your, that your favorite show has the best characters in it? Okay, so maybe my favorite show has the best characters in it. So how might you show that a character is so great? <laughs> All the stuff that they do? So maybe you could say, well, my characters are really great, they're really well formed, and they do a lot of stuff in the story, which makes the plot very exciting. Uh, the characters in your show are kind of badly formed. They're stereotypical characters. They're not three-dimensional, something like that. So, uh, and, and you can use tactics like that really well in your response to literature as well. Now, if you wanted, you could respond by telling your teacher that the book was a crock of dung. But I do have one disclaimer that might not get you a very good grade and also uh, the trick is to write something that really shows the reasons and gives that um, statement some background. In order to convince your reader that your opinions are worthwhile, you need to be able to provide reasons. When you write a response to a book that you didn't like very much, you use the same tactics. You try to convince your reader that the book isn't worth their time. Oh, oops, sorry, I think that was a repeat from... Oh, sorry, these slides are not repeated right there. Okay. So you need to provide evidence. A literature is a piece of writing with artistic value, which means that in your response to literature, let's say you're choosing kind of an unconventional piece of writing, you would need to back up why that was literature. So literature is generally considered the most prestigious type of writing. Who gets to decide what literature is? Usually it's adults, but today we get that opportunity to choose what's literature, and we can kind of back that up. So there are many types of fiction that aren't usually considered literature. Mysteries, adventure novels, horror novels, romance novels, and comic books, to name a few. Now, uh, choose a story that you want to defend. Choose a work of fiction that you think is worthwhile, that you think is meaningful, interesting, and that you think is literature. So it should be something that you've already read, something that you feel pretty familiar with. So what are some book ideas you have for your response to literature? What are some books you would like to write about? Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Okay, great. Any others? I'm sorry? Jerome Stilton. Jerome Stilton. Jerome Stilton. Okay, great. And any others? The Twilight Series. The Twilight Series. Twilight. Okay. 
And let's get one more. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Okay, great. So we have uh, pretty much all of popular fiction rounded out right here. And these are usually not considered literature, probably, but that gives you the chance to defend them. Say, I think this is literature. I think this is a great book, and that's why I think it. So, for instance, for mine, uh, has anyone ever read this the comic series Calvin and Hobbes? No, I don't think so. Okay, well, um, Calvin and Hobbes is kind of a funny comic strip. It's about this rambunctious kid named Calvin and his pet tiger, Hobbes. Now, he thinks that his, so Hobbes, to the adults, looks like this stuffed tiger, but to him it's this, you know, living tiger. So it's kind of about the difference between kids' imagination, kids' reality, and adults' reality, which is uh, a really nice topic for a comic book, in my opinion. So I chose one of my favorite Calvin and Hobbes books, um, Something Under Your Bed is Drooling. And I'm going to prove that something with drooling in the title can be literature, too. Now, the way I'm going to go about doing that is start off by writing an outline. What's an outline? Um, the plot of the story? Yeah, well, let's see. An outline for a story would be the plot for a story. If I'm writing an outline for my response to literature, what do you think that would look like? defend this idea, a book with drooling in the title can be literature too. What are some steps I might take? Um, the beginning, middle, and end? Exactly, the beginning, middle, and end. So I want to have my introduction, I want to have my body, and I want to have my conclusion. So let's start with the introduction, the first paragraph. Oh, and by the way, here's kind of a cluster I might use. So I would start off with my uh, statement, a book with drooling in the title is literature too. Then I would use things like the style of the book, the characters, the plot, and the theme to back that up. So that's an example of brainstorming. Let's go on to the formal outline. In paragraph number one, so that's the introduction, I want to grab the reader's attention. Does anyone know what the sentence you use to grab the reader's attention is called? It might also no. be something you use to catch fish with. Mm -hmm. well, the hook? Yeah. yeah, the hook, exactly. The hook is the sentence at the beginning that grabs the reader's attention, kind of snares them like fish. <laughs> sort of a weird analogy, but here's an example of this hook. Want to escape to a lazy Sunday? Pick up a copy of Something Under the Bed is Drooling by Bill Latterson. So the hook is, want to escape to a lazy Sunday? That's sort of asked as a question. What would I call this question at the beginning that I don't really expect anyone to answer? Well, when you ask a question as a hook that you don't expect your readers to answer, it might be a little hard for them uh, to answer, then it's called a rhetorical question. So a rhetorical question can be used really effectively as a hook. So in paragraph number one, for the introduction, I want to grab the reader's attention. Then I move on to summarize the plot. So you guys said that you haven't read the Calvin Hobbes comic series, and let's say that a lot of people haven't. So then I would need to summarize the plot, and this is a good idea, even if you're writing response literature to a book that probably everyone has read, just so that they're able to review the book. So, for example, uh, Calvin is terrified of the monsters under his bed and does everything in his power to stop them including spraying toxic insect spray and attacking them with a fire extinguisher, but he constantly gets in trouble with his parents who don't believe in monsters. So in the summary, I'm telling about the main plotline of the book. It's Calvin versus the monsters, but it's also kid reality versus adult reality. So I'm kind of laying out that thing right in that summary. So you want to grab the reader, reader's attention, summarize the plot, and in paragraph number one, I'm also going to tell the readers about my purpose, what I'm trying to do. So I will tell the reader that I aim to defend the book. I'm looking at Calvin Hobbes from a positive light. I'm saying this is a great book. This is literature. Here's an example of the way I might do that. Maybe a comic book isn't the first thing that springs to mind when you think of literature, but Something Under the Bed is Drooling by Bill Watterson is full of deep meanings, and nobody can claim that it's not artistic since it has wonderful drawings in it. Now that I have finished my first paragraph, the introduction, I would move on to paragraph number two. So in the second paragraph, 
I would tell the reader about when and where the book is set and how this makes the book interesting. So you would summarize the book and you tell about the setting, where and when the book is set. For example, the book is set in Calvin's neighborhood, in the woods behind his house, and most importantly, in the worlds of Calvin's imagination. The parts set in Calvin's imagination contrast sharply with the normal world his parents seem stuck in. Why would it be so important to talk about setting? So to have an idea of where it's at. To have an idea of where it's at, very good. You wanted to tell the reader about the setting for one of the same reasons that you have the summary. Because the reader may not have read the book, it might be a long while since they read the book, and they need to know that information. What might be another reason you would tell your reader about the setting? So that they know what's happening. Very good. And another thing is that the settings in books always play an important role in how the book goes on in the plot. So uh, you want to tell about the setting because it's an important ingredient in the book. Now in paragraph number three, I would move on to plot. What is plot? To tell the story. To tell what the story is about. Very good. So the plot of the story is what happens in the story. For example, Calvin's battle with the monsters is both exciting and funny. It's exciting because the monsters are very sinister, and it's funny because Calvin is sure that the monsters are real, but his parents think that he's making the whole thing up. So what is the thing that plots in pretty much all books have, that one thing? Something big happening? Something big happening, very good. Specifically, something big happening might be a conflict. So what is conflict? It would be a problem. It would be where the character might have to fight against something. They might have to make a decision. So most plots in, in a lot of stories you'll read will have a conflict. And here's a conflict right here. Calvin is sure that the monsters are real, but his parents think that he's making the whole thing up. There is your conflict. So you want to lay out the plot for the reader in paragraph number three. In paragraph number four, I would tell the reader a little bit about the characters and describe how they make the book interesting or meaningful to me. So, uh, for Diary of a Wimpy Kid, how do the characters make the book interesting to you? Um, they make it funny? They make it funny. Right. So, um, what's the character's main name again? Uh, sorry, the main character's name again. Is it Greg or... Greg. Greg, okay, right. So he has an older brother and a little brother, if I'm remembering this correctly. And so you might think about how do those characters play off of each other? Do those characters contribute to how interesting the book is? Um, are those characters kind of comic relief? So think about things like that, and you would write about uh, the characters. So in Calvin Hobbes, the main character is Calvin, a rambunctious first grader. I like reading about Calvin because he gets away with all the stuff that I only dream of doing. For instance, I would never ride a wagon down a steep cliff and um, survive the fall as well. Calvin ends up doing a lot of impossible things in the comic strip, and those are things that I kind of end up doing. So you talk about why the characters make you like the book. In paragraph number five, I would describe the book's theme, or the meaning of the book. Now, theme is one of those things that I know a lot of people have trouble with, but uh, tell me, what do you think are the themes of some books that you've read? And books can have more than one theme. A mystery? Well, yeah, let's say a mystery story. Um, you, if you have a mystery story, you might think about the theme. What is the kind of meaning? What is the meaning behind that story? So, for instance, in Calvin and Hobbes, the book is about how imagination enriches our lives. Kind of that message that the story gets across. The differences between the ways kids look at the world and the way adults look at the world. So that's another theme. And through his characters, Watterson also comments on the foolishness of many aspects of modern life. So we already have three themes right here. Imagination, enriching our lives. The difference between kids looking at the world and adults looking at the world. And also the foolishness of some aspects of modern society. So a theme is kind of hard to pinpoint sometimes, but you want to read the story and what is the message that the author is kind of getting across here. 
In paragraph number six, I would describe the writer's writing style. For example, Watterson writes in a queer, funny style that is full of intelligent quips and references to literature and history. How does the author of the Twilight series write?
a question that they don't answer? Yeah, it's a question that they don't necessarily answer. You just kind of ask it for a point. Now, you could also describe a scenario. What's a scenario? Okay. A scene? Uh, well, yeah, it would be a scene, exactly. Actually, that's pretty easy because the first uh, few letters are the same scene. So you could ask a rhetorical question, describe a scenario. Now, a rhetorical question is that question as to produce an effect or make a point. And a rhetorical question is a question that you don't expect the answer to. You might ask that rhetorical question and grab your reader's attention and get them to think about the topic. So a sign that the readers would say, hmm, that's a really interesting question, and kind of get that, and get them to ponder that in their minds. For example, would you like to have access to an immense fortune and an unlimited supply of candy? I know I would. Reading Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by Roald Dahl allows us to imagine for just a few precious hours that we have just such an opportunity. So the rhetorical question, or the hook, is right here. Would you like to have access to an immense fortune or an unlimited supply of, and an unlimited supply of candy? And it gets to be your thing, hmm, that would be so cool. And it gets some kind of interest in what is this person talking about? Is there something in it for me? And reading on, they'll realize that this is a book and uh, what the book is about. And that actually serves kind of a, uh, a double purpose. This also tells the reader a little bit about what happens in the book. Someone gets an immense fortune and an unlimited supply of candy. So what kind of rhetorical question could we ask to get readers excited about the Calvin Hobbes comic strip? Sorry, a scenario. Imagine that a vampire came to whisk you into a love story, or what if a vampire 
in the whiskey with. Um, then you're getting people thinking about that, and they're also uh, knowing a little bit more about what Twilight is about. It's about this vampire who whisks you away to a love storm. So that kind of has that double purpose. It's hooking the reader in, because that sounds kind of interesting, and it also gets them to realize what the book is about. What is a rhetorical question you might ask if you were uh, trying to hook readers in for Harry Potter? It's really cool. So a rhetorical question is that question that you ask. Uh, you're not intending to get a response, but you're saying something like, what if... The Hogwarts came. <laughs> okay, yeah. What if what if a giant or what if a half giant came to your aunt and uncle's house and uh, explained that you had magic powers or something like that on your eleventh birthday? I think that's what it was. Okay, so yeah, you might say something like that. Like a rhetorical question, a scenario is a good way to hook your reader's attention. You can choose to use either a scenario or a rhetorical question to give your writing a snappy beginning. So think about for your response to literature, uh, would you want to use a scenario or a rhetorical question? If so, uh, and, and which one and why? So let's try to think of the pros and cons of each. What would be the benefit of asking a rhetorical question? Any ideas? It would, interest, it would interest your reader into the subject. It would interest your reader in the subject. Very good. It would get them interested uh, in what you're talking about, and it would get them to think. What about a scenario? What would be the advantage of writing, uh, writing a scenario? story is about, much like a rhetorical question, it might also get the reader kind of in that mood of saying, oh, this is really interesting, it's sort of like reading a book almost, and so, yeah, we'd give that a kind of interesting beginning. So both a rhetorical question or a scenario is fine. Just try to think about the pros and cons of each when you're deciding which to use as a hook. So here is what we're going to work on right now. Write an introductory paragraph to your response to literature. Um, and now one of the things that we also have to do in our introductory paragraph is write a synopsis. What is a synopsis? Well, take a look at this visual for one. So let's say I start with this giant book, I put it into this funnel, and I get out is the story of a poor boy who is made to tour the world's best chocolate factory. So. A synopsis is kind of a summarization of the book. You put the book into the funnel, kind of you write, and you get out a synopsis. So a synopsis is that one or two line summary of your book that you want to have in your response to literature. A synopsis or summary is a shrunken version of the story. It's the summary, so for instance, how would you summarize a twilight? <laughs>
in England. And then Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is about a poor boy named Charlie Bubble. Where does that take place? and then also in that chocolate factory. So, if you can know about the title, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, that's a bit of a hint. Something Under the Bed is Drooling is about a rambunctious first grader named Calvin, and that happens in the U.S. So, when you are thinking about each one of these stories, you want to think, who is in it? So, Harry Potter, Charlie Bucket, uh, Calvin, where does it take place? England, England, United States. Um, and maybe getting more specific than that, you might say Hogwarts, the Chocolate Factory, Calvin's House. And then you would also uh, answer some questions like, when does it take place? And just give enough information that your reader gets what it's about, but don't give away the whole thing. What changes? In a book, you might notice that the character changes from the beginning to the end. So, for instance, in Harry Potter, he changes over the course of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. So, uh, it's about an orphan named Harry Potter whose dreary life is transformed when he discovers he has magical powers. He suddenly gains these new abilities. He makes new friends. He becomes kind of a different person. Charlie in the Chocolate Factory is about a poor boy named Charlie Bucket whose dreary life is transformed when he wins a chance to visit a famous and mysterious chocolate factory. So in both of these examples, both Harry Potter and Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, you have this dreary life that suddenly becomes better or not. Um, when you get magical powers, you get this chance to visit somewhere. So often, a character will get an opportunity to do something. They might get trapped somewhere. They might go somewhere. And over the course of that, they will change. They will gain new characteristics. They will lose some characteristics. Something Under the Bed is Drooling is about a rambunctious first grader named Calvin who discovers that there are evil monsters living under his bed. And over the course of the story, he changes in order to deal with them. So let's practice. What book should I write a brief description for? Here's the hook, the rhetorical question. Here's a book that allows you to do just that. 
Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling is a story of an orphan whose dreary life is transformed when he discovers he has magical powers. The plot isn't the only thing that's cool about the book. As a writer, Rowling has several other tricks up her sleeve. So, do you think that this introduction is going to be positive? Oh, sorry, the response to literature, do you think that will be positive or negative, the way I look at Harry Potter? Can you Positive, exactly. So why, why do you say that the response to literature would be positive? Um, because the magic between artistic, it seems like a new kind of series that we've been around before. Very good. So another thing is that I'm asking everyone to escape from reality. Here's a book that allows you to do just that. So I'm talking about as a way you can escape from reality, kind of cool. Now, the plot isn't the only thing that's cool about the book, so I'm obviously saying this is a great book. As a writer, Rowling has many other tricks up her sleeve. So this would be showing your intention, saying, I like this book, I'm going to be talking about its good side and the great things about this book. The sentence, the last sentence, tells my reader more about my intention, whether I'm going to defend the book or attack the book, so obviously I am defending the book here. Now, uh, here's an activity. Write an introduction to your response to literature. Be sure to include a hook to grab the reader's attention, the title of the book, the name of the book's author, a little bit about what the book is about, and a little bit about your aims in writing the response. Now, you don't have to write the whole response literature right now. What I want you to do is kind of write an outline for your introduction. So, first think of the title of the book that you want to write about. Any ideas? The Bone Series. The Bone Series? Okay, great. So, uh, think of the title of the book. It could be a series. Um, write that down on your piece of paper. Uh, does anyone have a piece of paper? Yeah. yeah. Great. Which bones ones do you Pick one. Um, Which one of the bones? The Great Calories. Okay, great. So write down uh, the title of the book. If it is a series, you can choose one of them because it will be difficult to write a response to literature for every single book, especially if the series is lots of months books. So, for instance, for the title of the book, um, what will I do? I will write, um, I'm trying to think of a good one I could write about. I will do Sense and Sensibility. Okay, so, uh, Sense and Sensibility is a book by Jane Austen. It's a little bit like Pride and Prejudice, actually. Now, I would write a hook to grab the reader's attention. After I've come up with my title, Sense and Sensibility, I would think of a hook. So, uh, Sense and Sensibility is basically the story about these two sisters, Marianne and Eleanor, who are, I guess, trying to find love, but in this world where money dictates the rules of marriage, not love. And so, a hook that I might write, imagine if you lived in the 1800s, where money and politics governed the rules of marriage instead of love, something like that. So kind of a scenario. Um, then the name of the book's author, Jane Austen. A little bit about what the book is about. So it's about these two sisters who live in 1800s England and are trying to get married, but obviously they face lots of challenges along the way. A little bit about your aims in writing the response. So I might say Sense and Sensibility is a wonderful book which uh, not only tells us a lot about that time period, but also gives us insights into sisterhood or something like that. So, uh, you would want to come with a title. Think of a good way you could hook your readers, whether it's a rhetorical question or a scenario like I did. The name of the book's author, a little bit about what the book is about, and a little bit about your aims in writing the response. Would anyone like to share the title they chose? Tell them about how exciting it's going to be. Tell them about how exciting it's going to be. That might be one way. 
you might also uh, ask a question. I, I'm not sure what that book is about, but would you mind telling me what the book is about? Um, there's these two characters who got in big trouble because they ran away, and, and it's in a mythical place, and there's all these rat creatures they're called. They're bad things, and there's a cow race that they have every year. Everybody bets on cows, whoever's going to win. And then the two people screw up the cow race, and uh, the rat creatures end up in town. Okay, that sounds pretty interesting. So, you've already told me quite a bit about what the book is about. You have your title of the book. Uh, what is the book's author? Do you know that offhand? Uh, Jeff Smith. Great. Okay, so you have that. And then, uh, do you like this book? Yes. You like the book. Great. So that's your aim in writing the response. You're defending the book. You're saying this book is great. Uh, and then you have your hook to catch the reader's attention. You're saying it's a great book, basically. You might also uh, have a scenario like, imagine if you messed up this cow race or something like that. Might be so, there you have it. That's pretty much all you need to do. Uh, now, First, start off, obviously, with your title. Think of what you want to do for your book, the name of the book's author, a little bit about what the book is about, and a little bit about your aims in writing the response. Do I like the book? Do I hate the book? How am I going to provide reasons to back that up? So, you probably don't kind of finish all this right now, but you should have this done by the time we have our next video conference. So, uh, work on that when you can. All right, now, do any of you have questions that you would like to ask?
rhetorical question would be like, uh, would you like to have access to an immense fortune and a chocolate factory at your disposal, or something like that? Yeah. Okay, so uh, great to hear from you about what you've learned. Any quick questions I can make? Okay, great. No, well, I'm sorry? You get both of my books, Flying Fingers and Dancing Fingers, at my website, adorasbtalk.com, which you should definitely check out. But Dancing Fingers is this book of poetry, and I wrote that, uh, and, and it was published just about a year ago. Oops, it fell. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Well, thank you very How much. Books have you published? Oh, I published two books. Yeah. Two? Yes, two. Um, the first one is called Flying Fingers, and it's a book of my short stories, as well as tips for writing for students and parents. My second book is Dancing Fingers, and it's a book of poetry that I co-authored with my sister. So, uh, my two books, one is short stories, one is poetry. How long do you usually take to write a book? How long do I usually take to write a book? Uh, it really varies, because... When you write different kinds of books, like I do, sometimes I write poetry, sometimes I write short stories, sometimes I write nonfiction, and it really varies with each one of those. With a poem, it'll take me um, a few minutes if I have the idea. With a short story, it'll take me a few weeks, and with a very long story, it could take a few years. <laughs> Usually not quite as long as that, but definitely there is a lot of variance depending on whether you have the idea right there how fast you're typing, and I type pretty quickly, but it definitely, it's a process, but it's a very fun one. <laughs> how old were you when you published your first and second book? I was seven when I published Flying Fingers, and I was, let's see, 11 when I published Dancing Fingers. I'm 12 now. Are you old for you when you started writing books? I'm sorry? How old were you when you started writing books? How old was I when I started writing books? Well, I was four years old when I started writing stories. I published my first book at seven, so in the lag time between there, I had quite a few years. And then also when I was six, my mom bought me my first laptop and I started typing up my stories on it. Uh, when will you be turning 13? When will I be turning 13? Uh, October 15th. Anyone else have a birthday in October? <laughs> I do. Oh, really? October 15th. Really? We share a birthday. Yes. Oh, great. That is so cool because... I'll be turning a little older than... <laughs> oh, well, I wouldn't have known it. Are, are you working on a book right now? Yes, I am writing many more poems. Uh, I'm hoping to publish another book of poetry. And I would also like to perhaps publish a... A nonfiction book, um, and and with some of the commentary I have on my blog, so I am working on some books right now. Have you got to meet um, other authors because of your publicity? Yes, I have gotten to meet quite a few other authors, as a matter of fact, which is uh, exciting. Uh, it's very cool. I've gotten to meet. Let me think of a few. Uh, let's see, Lois Lowry. She wrote quite a few books, Number of the Stars. Um, also, Shannon Hale and um, Karen Cushman. Um, let me think of a few others. Oh, and actually, um, coming up, I'm going to be going to Toronto in June, and um, I, I'll meet some authors there. I believe Margaret Atwood. Uh, so I, I'm definitely getting to meet a lot of really cool people. Is that it, guys? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Great. Well, thank you so thank you. very much. Thank you. And I hope you enjoyed writing your introduction to the response to literature. And have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you.